And I'm Josh Golke. I'm the Deputy Opinion Editor at the B. Um, I'd like to welcome the candidates for the uh, 6th Senate District. Uh, thank them for coming. We're going to uh, start the endorsement interview by giving them each three minutes for an opening statement. And uh, since we're We've been going in alphabetical order. I'll, uh, we can start with uh, Roger. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Roger Nilo. Um, I uh, am a uh, automobile dealer by vocation, uh, really a politician by avocation. I spent 25 years uh, in the retail automobile business with the Nilo Company Auto Group, of which I am still a, a co-owner and a corporate director. Uh, my first profession was in public accounting, so I'm a CPA, though retired from that uh, profession. I, uh, uh, after 25 years running car dealerships, I went into politics, served six years on the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors, and then six years in the state assembly. And uh, when I turned out, I'd been away from the dealership operation long enough that I didn't re-enter it. Uh, operationally, though I'm still obviously very connected, uh, but in the uh, 10 years since I termed out, I've, I've been on a number of uh, nonprofit boards, mostly higher education and economic development related. And uh, for three years, I ran the Sacramento Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce and uh, then was hired uh, for a uh, really sort of an assignment job, if you will, running a uh, uh, an agency for El Dorado County. So I have what many people might say is a rather confused resume. All right, thank you, uh, Paula. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Paula Viescas and I am running to be the next state senator for Senate District 6. Um, I am first and foremost an advocate and a public servant. Uh, with an extensive background in uh, the subject matters of public education, healthcare, and emergency response. I'm running to uh, protect and improve public education to ensure quality access to healthcare for all Californians and all citizens of SD6, as well as ensure that all of our communities have a full, robust um, mental and behavioral health um, economic and community response and robust response and support to COVID-19 to ensure that all of our communities are supported moving from this devastating pandemic. Um, growing up, a little bit about me growing up, it was just my mom and I, and um, I, my mom finished the eighth grade before she had to drop out of her formal education to take care of her siblings. And so Raised by a single mom, I myself also joined the workforce as soon as I could and um, have benefited tremendously and I'm a product of this community and this district and of the school district that I'm so proud to serve now as a school board member. That's the San Juan Unified School District. I became the first person in my family to graduate from college. I know firsthand that a strong public education system that meets the needs of all students is the key to succeeding and getting a piece of, kind of, of that American dream as we know it and achieving social mobility for a working class family such as mine. Um, in addition to that, or because of that, I am proud to serve um, for the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education. I was elected in 2016 and re-elected in 2020. And in my tenure, I have I served two consecutive terms as board president for the school district where we safely reopened schools and navigated the choppy waters of COVID. We passed Measure P, uh, the largest facility bond on the ballot in 2016 to rebuild our aging schools. And I've worked hard to increase access and uh, access to rigorous programs for all of our students. In addition to that, I'm also a healthcare policy advocate. And this is another part of my story that's personal. I am a cancer survivor. I went off to UC Berkeley. I believe that's something me and my opponent have in common. We will be represented by Bear, <laughs> go Bears. And while I was there, I was diagnosed with a very rare and aggressive cancer. And, and that was the same spring that the Affordable Care Act was being debated. So because I had to, and because my life was on the line, I had to become a patient advocate for high quality access to healthcare. 
And that informs a lot of the work that I've done and a lot of and why a lot of these issues are my key issues and why I would like to represent the people of SD6. All right, thanks very much. Um, I'll start since you talked about um, healthcare and, and the pandemic, I'm, I'm curious, um, the uh, legislature has recently dropped a, a whole series of bills that were under consideration uh, that would have um, created uh, different sorts of vaccine requirements, um, including a um, uh, mandate for school vaccine to add COVID to the uh, relatively long list of school vaccinations that are required. Um, that legislation seems to be on hold. Uh, we've also seen uh, just uh, yesterday the uh, the national uh, mask mandate for, for air transit um, uh, being struck down. Um, so I'm wondering what, as a member of the legislature, you think the right approach is going forward. Do you think uh, any uh, vaccine or mask mandates are still appropriate going forward? And what else, uh, what else should the legislature be doing um, in terms of uh, managing uh, the pandemic going forward? And we could start with uh, Paula this time. Sure, thank you for that question. And first and foremost, I just, I want to acknowledge that the pandemic has not been easy for anybody. And I think we're all ready to move beyond mask mandates and vaccine requirements and get back to what we formerly knew as, as normal. There's a lot of pain associated with making our way through a pandemic. Um, however, we must, move forward in an evidence and science-based approach. I would support moving forward infra infrastructure and, and guidelines that are based in public health and sound science and accommodate the changing needs of local communities as the spread of COVID both experiences increases and then recesses. We, we're seeing this now. We're seeing spikes across the country and other parts of the world. It's not a static response anymore. That's not what our communities need. Moving forward, we have to absolutely ensure that all of our communities and the role of the legislature is to ensure that all of our communities have the robust public health infrastructure to continue to support a COVID response to keep everybody safe, to keep our most vulnerable neighbors and our children safe. And so that is a complex kind of infrastructure that includes support for the mitigations that we know work, which includes vaccines. It includes masks, it includes testing. We have to maintain all of that infrastructure like a muscle that we have been exercising and make sure that it's ready to exercise when the data determines that it's necessary, when we see an increase in spikes in local levels, et cetera. That would be my approach and that's the approach I believe is appropriate for the legislature moving forward. All right, thank you, uh, Roger. Well, I, I think it was appropriate for the legislature to drop those bills because I think those decisions are really best made at the local level, uh, cities, counties, school districts, uh, and the like. Uh, I don't agree with uh, those mandates being uh, uh, imposed on high by the state and certainly not by uh, the federal government, nor do I think the state or the federal government should prohibit uh, local governments from uh, entertaining those things. Um, certainly as advised by uh, public health entities of which each county uh, uh, has one. <clears throat> the, uh, the need though does seem to be uh, letting up. Uh, it has been a, a, a very frustrating roller coaster for sure. And uh, uh, we're probably not done with it. I'm not a public health expert, but it would appear to me uh, that what's happening is the variations of the virus uh, as it mutates becomes arguably uh, more transmissible, uh, but, uh, but much more mild in terms of cis, uh, symptoms and frequency of hospitalization and the like. So uh, the need for uh, masking and, and, uh, and vaccine 
uh, is certainly nowhere near as acute as it was before. Uh, I am a vaccine proponent. I've been vaccine. I've been vaccinated twice and boosted, though I did get COVID just before I was boosted, and it was last fall, and it was extremely unpleasant. But I've had me- uh, family members who have had it since. And in some cases, they almost didn't know they had it outside of testing, uh, supporting what I just said about it being maybe more transmissible, but extremely um, uh, more mild. So uh, we seem to be headed in the right direction uh, from that standpoint, and I'm relieved, but uh, cautious. I want to uh, switch gears completely. We can always go back to, to health care, but um, let's talk about drought and wildfire, which is an issue that affects our state, um, including this district. Over the past year, CAP Radio has reported on several ineffective wildfire prevention policies under the Newsom administration that failed to deliver on the sort of scale California needs to alleviate the risk of burning. So I'm wondering what policies would you support to make um, the fire prone areas of our state and and this district safer. And Roger, let's start with you. Well, for the last hundred years, we've followed uh, what uh, seemed to be now concluded as being rather misguided. Every time a fire broke out uh, in in wildfire areas, uh, we rushed to put it out. And uh, so we've developed uh, forests that are in many cases Uh, overgrown. And uh, uh, it's going to take a lot of resources to um, uh, thin out forests that are uh, thick and overgrown, and uh, that can help reduce the intensity of wildfires. You mentioned uh, uh, water, and uh, that is an extremely important issue. It always has. I've been uh, very much involved in issues related to water supply and flood control. And by the way, don't forget, we still have uh, flood risks in our area, even though it's hard to imagine right now, uh, due to the nature of, uh, of rainfall in this area, alternating from way too much to way too little. Uh, and uh, we've not done a very good job of keeping up with, uh, uh, with our water supply. So uh, intense forest management, uh, as well as uh, uh, increasing our water supply for the sake of the supply, but also for the sake of retention because of still the risk uh, long-term of floods. Thank you, Paula. Thank you for the question. And in terms of uh, fire risks and fire management, one key part to remember is one, there's absolutely no doubt that every season seems to be a little bit worse than the past and the human toll, the toll on our communities um, just continues to, to grow. And it's something that I've seen um, from, the, from the ground up as Assistant Secretary for Health and Human Services Agency. I oversaw and coordinated the work of the department responsible for provision of mass care and shelter for a community in the event of a uh, disaster or of natural or otherwise. And like so many of our local jurisdictions, we are now in the business of frequently and almost on an annual basis, providing that mass care and shelter for communities. And so it's important to remember kind of the direct human toll and the number and the amount of investments that are necessary to truly make our communities um, prepared to address these because this isn't, you know, the risk of fire and climate change. It's not something that's 20 years out anymore. It's at our doors and on our doorstep every single season. So making sure that we have the infrastructure necessary to meet the direct needs of communities and to ensure even basic evacuation of some of our most vulnerable communities. Those are some of the um, efforts and focuses I've been able to focus on as a professional um, wearing a, a variety of hats. And so that part is certainly important. The other piece is forest management is complicated and we only have control over so much. It has, it's a cooperative agreement and relationship. A lot of this land is also managed and uh, by the federal government. And so it's key that we are working in cooperation at all layers of government 
to uh, mitigate that risk moving forward. But first and foremost, my priority is making sure that we're building resilience within our communities because that human toll is real every single season and people are losing so much every single season. Thanks. Um, on a somewhat related note, um, the wildfires are obviously related to climate change and uh, to some extent. And um, there's been some back and forth in the legislature lately about uh, gas consumption and gas prices and a series of proposals to um, to uh, ease uh, some of the pain people are feeling from gas prices. On the other hand, some some uh, critics think that maybe easing gas consumption is maybe not the best approach given uh, the repercussions of uh, burning fossil fuels and uh, warming the planet and uh, inviting more wildfires. Um, so I'm wondering, um, whether you support the efforts to um, either provide uh, uh, rebates or a tax holiday, a gas tax holiday has been proposed, um, or just cash rebates across the board. There's been a lot of debate over whether the rebates should be capped uh, according to income. Uh, some of the proposals would give uh, cash rebates to everybody in California, regardless of income. Uh, one of the proposals is capped at $250,000 a year, which is about 90% of taxpayers would be included in, under that umbrella. Uh, what do you think? Do you think easing uh, uh, gas consumption and gas, uh, the pain of gas prices is the right approach? And how do you think, how would you support going about it as a legislator? Um, we'll start with Paula this time. Thanks, Josh. And, and first and foremost, just want to acknowledge the challenging decisions that people are making every single day. And as someone who grew up in a household that struggled, I remember, um, I remember what it meant to have to choose between, um, you know, putting some money in the gas tank, not even filling it up. That wasn't a luxury that we could afford, but putting some gas in the gas tank or, um, paying bills or knowing which bills we could go a little bit further behind on um, and still literally keep the lights on. So that, that pain is real at, uh, you know, that's a, impacting families and pocketbooks every single day. In terms of the variety of the proposals that are currently on the table, I support the rebate to drivers. I think individuals and families need immediate relief to what, to some of the confluence of events that we've seen um, that are raising prices and, you know, raising the cost at the pump for sure. However, I don't think it should be available to everybody. I think that it should be available to, if we were to kind of figure out the right um, dividing line here, I think it should be available to individuals who drive a gas car. They're the ones that are paying the extra costs. And, uh, but we must not in, in focusing on this debate, we can't lose sight of the bigger picture here, which is that this is one solution to an immediate problem where we provide relief, but we absolutely must be the state that continues to lead the fight to curb climate change. We must continue to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and accelerate our decarbonizations to meet our 2030 climate goals. We cannot let these one-off uh, challenges, we must address them as they come, as they come along and really address and meet the needs of our families every single day and concurrently address the big picture challenges because those parts are not going to go away. Thanks, Roger. Well, uh, from a, a larger perspective, uh, the inflation that we're seeing is uh, extremely alarming. Uh, I remember the stagflation that we uh, experienced back in the 1970s, and it was economically painful. And the solution to it was uh, extremely economically painful as interest rates spiked, uh, the prime rate spiked up to 20%. And as an automobile dealer that uh, finances inventory, I certainly recall that. But the state really can't do anything about inflation. 
uh, but it is uh, definitely having an impact on everyday uh, people's lives, uh, with specifically with regard to uh, uh, gasoline prices. Um, that uh, seems to me the best, most efficient, and best targeted <clears throat> strategy uh, there would be uh, a gas tax holiday. And uh, rebates broadly to everybody really doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Uh, the uh, suspension of the gas tax uh, provides, <clears throat> specifically with regard to gas prices, obviously provides that relief where it's most needed. I'm going to uh, switch gears here to talk about housing. Um, the legislature has struggled to make a dent in California's vast housing shortage, and some local governments are even resisting the recently enacted law legalizing duplexes. Um, what policies would you pursue to make it easier for Californians to live and work in the same community in a home or apartment that they can afford? Um, and Roger, let's start with you. Well, the the, the the supply and price <clears throat> of housing is largely uh, a marketplace issue and uh, uh, builders will tell you that uh, uh, the biggest challenges they have are um, uh, fees uh, uh, that are required uh, as well as uh, environmental restrictions. Uh, I have believed for a long time we need um, uh, serious uh, reform of the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, otherwise known as CEQA. We seem to uh, nibble at it for specific uh, projects like sports stadiums, <clears throat> excuse me, which does not make a lot of sense to me. We need a more broad um, uh, reform of that uh, specifically to make building more efficient and, uh, and less expensive. The, uh, the approaches from the state that mandates the local governments uh, where things uh, can and can't be built, I think is kind of dangerous because um, not every community is the same. Uh, and, and I think to provide legislative uh, uh, mandates uh, from the state level <clears throat> that affect all communities the same uh, it has definitely a definite quality of life impacts that uh, local governments still uh, should have input on. Uh, the state can provide guidelines, but I think uh, local governments still need, the counties and cities especially, need to be the local uh, land use uh, authorities. Thanks. Paula? This is a significant challenge and one that's going to be kind of one of the landmark issues that, that we face both immediately and, and in the out years. And this is another issue that's extraordinarily personal as well. Growing up, me and my mom, we were housing insecure. We were evicted often and having to find the next place that we could afford to live was um, why I ended up going to many different elementary schools growing up, I, I know the disruption that it causes and the, the insecurity that it comes with it is a significant challenge. We absolutely must build more and we have to find solutions that allow local governments to meet their needs at each, at each locality, both the counties and the states, but it is a two-way street. I think the state also should um, be ensuring a little bit more accountability to those local jurisdictions. Here in Sacramento County, I think it's a prime example where a number of different jurisdictions have spent the last couple of years pointing fingers at each other. And the reality is that this is going to be um, something that requires everybody to come to the table with the solutions that work for, for their community to work hand in hand. So building, by all means, building more inventory is a key component to anything that addresses housing. We also have to do a lot on the prevention side to make sure that individuals who are currently housed don't lose that housing. Um, it's one of the, a sad fact that the, grow, the highest growing population of homeless individuals in our state are seniors. In the wealthiest state, in the wealthiest station, that is the fastest growing group of individuals who are losing their housing. We must do more to support our senior population, but really all of our communities to maintain the housing that they have. A key to um, 
kind of, and you know, it's hard to separate housing and homelessness and I'm intentionally focusing on housing, but they do go hand in hand. And so in addition to br raising more inventory, making sure that that works for local communities, we have to do more to stabilize the existing um, housing situations that we do have now to not create further instability for our communities. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to follow up uh, on that question, Roger. You said that um, you, you're firmly in support of local governments um, being land use authorities, uh, which they certainly are. Um, but there is there is evidence, as you said, that CEQA is 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 part of the problem uh, in terms of. Uh, creating the vast housing shortage we have. But I mean, there are just countless examples of local government, um, you know, impeding housing construction of, of, of all kinds. Um, and, and most of the research on this subject uh, says local government zoning and other restrictions are a huge part of the the of what's caused the housing shortage in California and and the legislature's uh, efforts have to some extent focused on that, including the the duplex law that that Hannah mentioned. Do you, do you think that that's a mistake? You don't think the legislature should have legalized duplexes, or and, and you don't think the legislature needs to do anything about. Um, zoning and planning restrictions that are impeding housing construction at the local level is is that is that what you're saying roger i think that uh, the state has become uh has, is moving in the direction of becoming overly prescriptive uh, i did say that the state can provide guidelines but uh the reason that uh, you see the resistance where you do uh, from local governments uh, is coming from uh, actually the people that live near the projects. And uh, if the state becomes overly prescriptive, uh, then uh, that's going to be reflected by extremely dissatisfied uh, attitudes of voters. Uh, and uh, when that happens, uh, sometimes people can overreact with regard to uh, uh, ballot initiatives and uh, and election moves and and the like. So, I think it's it's just kind of dangerous for the state to impose prescriptive land use policies that are the same in San Bernardino County as they are in Los Angeles County as they are in Modoc County, and that appears to be the approach so far. I think that's a dangerous one. There has to be uh, the the uh, local governments uh, still have to be land use. Uh, authorities. But as I said, there can be guidelines from the state. And uh, perhaps we need uh, the local and state government officials to, to get together and talk about what might be a, a better balanced approach that can work for uh, quite different communities that we have throughout the state of California. Thanks. Uh, Paula, do you uh, agree that the state has gone too far in being prescriptive and telling local governments what they ought to do on this subject, or, or does it uh, need to go further in, in uh, preventing them from uh, obstructing uh, the building of, of housing? I, you know, I mentioned in the outset that uh, ensuring from the state level, some level of accountability is absolutely key. So the answer here is is a little bit somewhere <laughs> kind of in the in the middle. Um, the fact of the matter is the state completely staying out of it. You'll just get a kind of um, slight revision of the same thing we've been trying to do um, over recent years. And we know that it's not working. So absolutely state should be playing a stronger role. Now that doesn't mean we tell communities exactly what to do, how many units to build X, Y, Z. That means you build the table of accountability and say, and then give them the appropriate tools, right? To build in the infrastructure that works for each individual community. There is a balance here that says, yes, you, you must do, build out certain housing, but we're not going to tell you exactly what it needs to look like so that you can, that local governments can meet the needs of their own unique needs at the same time. 
an appropriate balance that needs to be struck. Thanks. Um, here in Sacramento, we've obviously seen a couple recent shootings, um, the debate over criminal justice reforms and increasing public safety is certainly top of mind for many voters right now. Um, and there has been an increase in violent crimes over the last two years in Sacramento, but unfortunately much of the political discourse revolves around ballot measures that address over incarceration and misdemeanor crimes. Um, what's your view on this debate in California and what policies would you introduce or support to ensure our criminal justice system is both fair and protects the public. And Paula, let's start with you. Thank you, Hannah. And, and first and foremost, while we're on the topic, I want to acknowledge the significant violence we saw in Fair Oaks just last night, where, um, you know, it's still an, a developing issue, but in a park, that during the day is occupied by families. It was this evening, you know, last evening, occupied instead by a large group of individuals and it um, devolved in significant violent crime in our backyards. And that's what we're seeing time and time again. Um, and it creates trauma for our entire community. We saw the shooting, of course, um, here at downtown. And then prior to that in February, there was another shooting. So. There's absolutely no doubt that crime is creating, is having a huge impact on our communities now. Um, the, in terms of solving, <laughs> solving crime, right? The key to crime is to understand its roots and crime is primarily the outcome of multiple and differing adverse social, economic and cultural family conditions. And this includes poverty and various social environments. The way to stop crime is to invest in our communities and in our schools, which is why the work that I've, I've done has been so important and why I've dedicated myself to building strong communities and schools to meet the needs of our children and families. However, and particularly speaking to the crime that we've seen here in Sacramento County in recent days, including last night, we must go further than that. That's no longer enough. We see that absolutely. We also have to stop access to and the avail availability of illegal guns. And we must get them out of the hands of criminals and of gangs. And we have to support law enforcement in doing so. Now, you included a question around propositions and I think propositions create a governance challenge because once they're passed, only through the will of voters can they be retracted or revised in any single way. And that's had a lot of adverse <laughs> impacts from from budgeting to now this confluence of events around kind of what we're seeing of this mixture of both Prop 47 and Prop 57, both of them together. I do believe that like most propositions, they have flaws. And I also believe in second chances, um, but both of those propositions could benefit from some revision. Thank you, Roger. Well, I think, uh... Uh, a good deal of the problems that we're seeing uh, are due to those two propositions, 57 and 47. Uh, they were passed by the voters, uh, but I think a lot of voters didn't fully understand uh, uh, what they were authorizing. Um, Proposition 57 allowed for uh, the uh, uh, credits uh, that we saw that were granted to uh, uh, one of the people involved in the shootings downtown where he had an original 10 year sentence and he was out after four or five. Now, your paper pointed out that he wasn't released early, but that's somewhat semantics because of the credits that he received, which uh, a system which is quite liberal because of those credits. He was released early. That is before the 10 years. I believe in second chances, too. But but third, fourth, and fifth chances is going a little bit uh, too far. And uh, that individual is a good example of, of uh, allowing too much leniency. He should not have been uh, out of jail. Uh, that needs to be reformed. And if we have to go back to the voters to do it, then we have to go back to the voters to do it. Proposition 47 uh, increased the, the threshold for misdemeanor versus uh, felony penalties. And that compared that combined with uh, 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 liberal district attorneys that we have in San Francisco and Los Angeles who 
aren't interested in prosecuting those misdemeanors. Uh, we've seen uh, spikes in the so-called smash and grab uh, um, uh, robberies in, in those areas, certainly more so there than, than in other areas. Uh, and uh, we absolutely have to have strong law enforcement, particularly with regard to gang activity. Uh, I was shocked by that uh, incident in our community. I live in Fair Oaks. Uh, and it appears very strongly that that was gang activity. And uh, clearly, uh, the gangs were involved in that horrible situation uh, downtown. And we need strong law enforcement to uh, uh, target gangs and, and, and attempt to control them before incidents like that uh, take place. So uh, we need a combination of, of strong, proactive law enforcement, uh, as well as some uh, reform to... Uh, uh, changes in laws, the laws that have taken place in the last couple of years, including go back, to, going back to the voters to modify things that they have approved, but perhaps uh, in a misguided way. I just wanted to follow up on that, um, uh, Paula. You mentioned uh, keeping guns out of the wrong hands. Um, the the state. Uh, does have a, a more gun laws than most um, and tougher gun laws than most, but the legislature did kill uh, an excise tax on guns that was proposed last year uh, that would have dramatically increased funding of violence prevention programs and, and was supported by a lot of people who are concerned about gun violence. Um, and, and the, um, there's also been some criticism of the state's uh, success in, in enforcing laws that are on the books against uh, uh, certain people possessing guns and, and, and um, failing to um, seize guns from, from people who aren't legally allowed to possess them. What, what do you think as a legislator, would you support it, an excise tax on guns? Um, or what other policies can be done to um, to improve uh, gun safety and 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 stem gun violence in, in your mind, Paul? Yeah, you know, and specific to to the excise tax, I think you'd be setting up a, a similar um, sort of it's kind of gets grouped into what we call sort of sin taxes, like the gas tax or the tobacco tax, where behavior that we're trying to decrease, right, is generating income. And that's how we're funding key programs to support victims of crime in our environment. So first and foremost, we should fund that outright. It should not be dependent on any kind of, of tax. Those are supports and services that we recognize are necessary for our communities. And, you know, right now, the fact of the matter is we have a surplus. So why tie it to those? The other components, right, of, of that specific provision is we're seeing more and more um, use of parts of these of ghost guns and moving components around to create um, illegal illegal gun parts at, that are now resulting in an increase, right? The increase in gun violence, I believe, even with our strong gun laws is due to an increase in availability to the weapons. And I don't think that necessarily gets to, the, to, to those challenges. We gotta regulate the ghost guns. We gotta increase enforcement when these guns and guns parts and gun components that create violence in our communities end up in the hands of criminals and gangs. And we also have to outright fund and support our communities with the services that they need. Roger, any thoughts on, on that subject? Yeah, where um, California uh, has uh, plenty of uh, public revenues. Uh, a uh, survey was just taken where people generally feel they're overtaxed anyway, and I happen to uh, agree with those with those sentiments. We have uh, extremely high taxation in California, both personal as well as business uh, on the income side. Uh, um, high sales taxes. We have the revenue to fund uh, sensible public safety programs. It's uh, a budget is a statement of priorities. And if we don't have that, then it's not a priority. 
uh, unless we put an excise tax on guns, that doesn't express the uh, priority particularly well. Um, California does, as you mentioned, have extremely strict uh, gun laws. Uh, these uh, violent crimes that we're seeing, uh, I suspect what happened downtown was uh, largely uh, people possessing guns who are not supposed to possess guns. There are specific examples of that, but I would suspect that probably every single one of them falls in under the category of either being possessed by someone who's not supposed to have a gun under California law or a gun itself that is illegal under California law. So I'm not sure how many more laws we can pass to avoid that particular uh, problem. Uh, we do need uh, very strict uh, enforcement of the gun laws that we have. Thanks. Um, I want to I wanted to ask about something that um, perhaps can't be legislated, and that's community relations. Um, over the past two years, disagreements and debates over COVID mandates and prevention measures have been on full public display, perhaps nowhere as clearly as school board meetings, city council and board of supervisor meetings. Um, you're running against a physician who's perhaps best known for showing up at school board meetings to tell families he'd give out uh, medical exemptions to mask mandates, no questions asked. Um, what do you believe your responsibility is, if elected, to begin to mend some of these community tensions? And how would you go about repairing some of the relationships that have broken down at these local levels? And Paula, let's start with you. Thanks, Hannah. And certainly as a, a sitting school board member, um, I had a lot of reflections of the questions that, that you just posed. And there's absolutely no doubt that serving on a school board has been one of the toughest, <laughs> toughest places in governance. I think the more local you get, the closer you are to people. And, um, and that's the part that I love about that service. Um, but the, the vitriol has certainly ramped up the last couple of years. And I think it's fair to say that I wasn't quite expecting everything that the last six years brought. However, it was absolutely my honor and privilege to wake up every single day and fight on behalf of my community for our, and for our children to keep them safe and to give them the strongest environment possible to do what everybody in the education business does, wants our children to do, which is to come ready to learn, to connect with their community, um, to be empowered, and to ultimately to succeed. Now, I know from experience that, that yes, there are groups who feel very, very strongly about and are kind of uh, on the anti, anti-vax, I'm gonna call them anti-vaxxers, right? That's who our opponent um, a kind of represents and, and brings to the table. The people who have strong feelings don't always show up at our school communities. And by being out into the, in the community and engaging often with folks who didn't necessarily always agree with me, but where we had the same interest of providing for our children, of providing for our communities, I worked hard to build those bridges. Now, there were, there's still challenges and anybody who's governed at all in the last six years, much less the last 12 years, maybe didn't always get it right. But I still showed up every day and said, my goal is to protect and provide for the best interest of my community. And having that conversation in, you know, out in the community, in coffee shops, with voters directly, I think ultimately people um, want leadership, particularly during the pandemic. Folks wanted individuals who came ready to responsibly govern. And that's what I did every single day. And I'm proud of that work, even if it was a challenge. Thank you. Roger? So I've noticed that individual frustration with things just generally have become extremely acute in the last couple of years beginning with the pandemic. Uh, one only needs to go out and drive on our freeways uh, and you experience that. Now that sound, might sound somewhat unrelated to what how you expressed the question, but I think it's very related. People have become just frustrated with things. And like I say, I really see that on the roads, but it's also why I've 
uh, maintained that uh, uh, vaccine and mask mandates and things like that uh, need to be addressed at the local level, not at the state or the federal level, because people get frustrated because they think they have no influence. Uh, that's what, and I served in local government too. I was on the board of supervisors and, and trust me, I sat through uh, uh, plenty of public hearings where people were yelling and screaming at me and my colleagues on the other side of the dais, sometimes me specifically, sometimes another colleague specifically, um, people can get awfully abusive uh, in situations like that. And it's because they feel relatively powerless. And the higher up you make decisions of things like that, the more powerless they feel. And I think that's driven a lot of that. So again, I think those issues need to be uh, addressed at the lowest level of government uh, uh, possible. And uh, uh, it, it's important for elected officials uh, to reach out to people um, and uh, and meet with them individually. It's very difficult to be mad and attacking a person when you actually know them. Uh, and uh, familiarity, uh, people say absence makes a heart grow fonder, familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, not really, familiarity uh, uh, creates a better relationship. So the frustration has been fed by the pandemic fed by people feeling they don't have any power over things, bring the things, bring things down as close to the local level as possible, I think uh, helps and reaching out to people to discuss things can help too. Thanks, so I wanted to uh, get back to uh, one more question about energy and climate. Um, the, uh, the California Public Utilities Commission has been considering a reform of the rooftop solar program, uh, which provides pretty healthy subsidies uh, uh, for um, to promote uh, rooftop solar. Um, the utilities are uh, have been pushing for a reform of that subsidy um, on uh, their stated reason is that uh that it's penalizing lower income uh rate payers uh although some of their critics think maybe they're not too thrilled that people other than them namely the owners of rooftop, rooftop solar uh rays are are generating electricity in their own right and they don't they don't like that kind of competition so uh, i'm just wondering um where each of you stands on the subject of this subsidy and whether it needs to be reformed and what kind of reform would be appropriate. And uh, we can start with Roger this time. Now by subsidy, do you mean the program where people sell back excess power to the provider at retail rates? Yeah, well, I've always had issues with that um, because uh, it is somewhat regressive. Uh, um, I remember uh, somebody presenting this to me when I was in the assembly, and, and I said, you know, this program carried to its fullest extent uh, would mean everybody had rooftop solar and everybody was selling excess power back at retail rates. That's not a sustainable model. And his response to me was, well, not everybody is going to be able to afford to put the rooftop solar on in the first place. So it kind of proved the point to me that uh, it is uh, it is regressive, and uh, the further it goes, uh, the less sustainable it is. So I haven't really been supportive of that particular plan. Uh, rooftop rooftop solar is fine for people uh, who can afford it and want to save their uh, uh, their electric bills by not drawing on the grid uh, is fine. Uh, with regard to climate control, I think we need to spend a lot of time figuring out how to, uh, uh, how to uh, address the effects as well as try to uh, reduce the, the cause. Uh, and we're spending, I think, uh, more time on trying to reduce the cause as opposed to uh, uh, adapting to the, uh, uh, to the effects of it. Thanks, Paula. Thanks for the question, Josh. And this is certainly 
this has a huge kind of implications of, of moving forward and, and how we um, really build solar power into our entire renewable portfolio across the state with significant implications, right? We have to be able to keep the lights on at all points of the day. And we've seen through PSPS and other events that um, that's not always the case. Now we are fortunate, of course, to live in SMUD territory here um, and have a utility provider that um, has stepped up to this challenge in pretty big ways. And I'm proud to have the unanimous support of the entire SMUD board. And they've shifted their focus to um, ensuring, right, because this the rooftop solar now created an excess <laughs> of solar power that we can't capture. We don't have the ability to capture right now. And so transitioning that and shifting to battery incentives is absolutely critical to make sure that we maintain and capture the energy that we do have. And they also did acknowledge that the previous subsidies that highly, highly incentivized the cost to even build it out, build out solar power from the beginning was very one-sided. It largely benefited wealthy white people. And that has resulted as the market became flooded <laughs> with solar power, then um, the cost came down, right? And so, uh, however, SMUD maintained its, its rate at 12 cents per kilowatt hour, right? When now, because of the infrastructure, they could actually get away with paying three cents per kilowatt hour for utility grade energy. And that's a difference of nine cents that's now spread amongst all ratepayers, regardless of whether or not they have that solar infrastructure and are benefiting from it. That's inherently unfair. And so using the principles of continuing to build out this important tool and resource, fairness in rates and stability in the grid, which is a key one. I've supported SMUD's move to what, you know, their um, net energy metering rates 2.0, their version, it was to modify the rate per kilowatt hour that they were paying. Um, and it differs between the last version of CPUC, which was a flat rate, right? And so um, I'm proud of the work that our local utility has done in really leading the state and leading the nation in this critical issue. And I'll continue to rely on these experts moving forward.